So our text for today comes from Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 27. And it is regarding um, the title um, From Groaning to Glory. Okay, so it reads like this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that creation itself will be um, will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the um, into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with life of times until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as a as first fruit, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our body. Now, in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is not it. Because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible and groaning. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. That's the word of the Lord. I'm excited to open up the word with you this morning. My name is Reino. For those of us who have not met, and I have the privilege of serving this church as pastor, and I'll be preaching to us this morning. Take a look at this picture. Buffed. Angry. Worn out. Done. Devastated. So ready to leave this world. Can't deal with it. So over it. You guys know what I'm talking about? Question. What do you pray when you are here? Another question. How is the Holy Spirit present and working in these moments? This is a painting by Vincent van Gogh, and I think it's a good depiction of growing found in verse 23. The painting is called At Eternity's Gate. It's an oil painting he did in 1890 in Saint-Rémy de Provence. It was completed two months before his death, and he did this while he was in a severe relapse at his house. Now, for those of you who might not know the story of Vincent van Gogh, it is a fascinating story, and there was a movie made of it at Eternity's Gate. He lived a life of hardships and frustration. But he was a believer. And he painted this. Sits clenched, bent over, fire, 
experiencing this emotion that you guys spoke about during question of the day. This is part of the human experience. It's not something we long for. It's not something that we want to press into. But it is inevitable that at some point in your life, you are going to find yourself there. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, there is hope to be found in today's text and teaching for times like these. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, there is hope to be found in today's text and teaching for times like these. The only difference is for the believer, it is already there. And you just need to grasp it. We'll get back to it later. For the person that doesn't believe, I want you to know before we even start diving into the text that God, God's hand has been extended to you. And you can also grasp the faith and good news through faith in Jesus Christ. This is what we learn about the Spirit today. One simple principle. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray in times like this. So over the last two weeks, we turned our focus to the Holy Spirit in our series called I Am Who I Am. So we looked at God, the creator of everything, with the name Yahweh. We looked at Jesus Christ, who is this God who became a human being, and he showed the heart and the character of God while being a human. And then we covered his perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension, still awaiting his return. And then we turned our attention to the Spirit. So over the last two weeks, we saw that the Spirit is a life giver. The Spirit creates life out of wild waste and chaos and turns it into beauty and order. We also spoke about the fact that the Holy Spirit, like the Son and like a farmer, brings forth fruit in our lives. We long for the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives it to us. Let me do a short prayer for us, and then we'll jump right in. Father, I feel needed, like a piece of dough. I feel ready to receive what you have for us. Thank you for leading us in this wonderful time of just refining our minds, refining our hearts, um, lavishing us with truth and grace and mercy, having us use our voices to praise you. I pray that you would illuminate our hearts and minds now, uh, and that we, that we would be attentive to what you would have for us. And Holy Spirit, above anything, I pray that we would learn how you would help us to pray in times that we are bent over, worn out, and tired. May the words of my mouth uh, be acceptable in Jesus. Amen. So there are three points for today. Here you go. I'll put it on the screen for you. Where are we now? Where are we headed? And how does the Spirit help us to pray in the in-between? I'll explain what the in-between is now. Where are we now? Where are we headed? And how does the Spirit help us to pray in between? Where are we now? Okay. So we read from a book called Romans. It was written by a guy named Paul, and he wrote to a community in a city called Rome, and therefore the letter is called the Epistle to the Romans. Paul is building a massive argument in the book of Romans, and this passage plays a key role in the structure of that argument. Right? So Paul is putting out what he believes, how the gospel works, how faith works, how sin works, what baptism is all about, what we do with the law and the role of the Holy Spirit. It's a huge, huge, huge system in the book of Romans. And in this part that we read today, he speaks about the liberation from slavery. He's spoken about it before. He speaks about resurrection. He speaks about sonship. He speaks about adoption. He speaks about the Spirit's part in all of this. And he's picking up things that he has written about before. So this is a really key passage, and that's why I chose to preach from it, because it kind of um, gives us a holistic view of the life of the believer and the role of the Holy Spirit. Now, at, the, at this point that we jump into the story, it is already intense, and it is already loaded at this point. So what we're going to do is we'll just walk through the teaching text. So those of you can just switch slides for me, please. Um, oh, let me just do this first. So this is part of the bigger section, Romans 5 to 8, in which Paul makes the point that through the gospel of Jesus Christ and through the role of the Holy Spirit, God is creating a new humanity that will look new, do new, and live new in this broken and fallen world. And by this humanity living in this new way, this creation will also be renewed. And then if I can just uh, show the next slide, please. In the whole of chapter 8, Paul speaks about Jesus and his atoning sacrifice and the role of the Holy Spirit. And you'll see where, where we'll end up is through the Holy Spirit, we will experience liberation. That liberation will mean that we can love God and we can love our neighbor, and that the whole of creation will be renewed. So that's kind of the trailer or a poster 
was a part of scripture that we read in at the moment. This was taken from the Bible Project. You can also uh, get it online. I think it's really cool to have the summary uh, of Bible books when you study the Bible. Okay, guys, next slide, please, everybody. So, all the goals and all the underlines in the teaching text, we're going to walk through them one by one. I promise we'll be done at least by 2 o'clock. Okay, so sit tight. I guess you guys are joking. Uh, let's move through them. So, Paul starts by saying, I am firmly of the opinion that, it says for I consider in this translation, but he says, it is my settled conviction. I really believe this. That's the Greek word that he used. And what's important for us is Paul doesn't make this point, or he doesn't say that he's firmly of opinion that, because he's thought about it. He says, I experienced something, and we'll get back, back to that later. And because of what I've experienced, I can tell you now that this is how it is. It is my settled conviction. Okay, where are we now? We are in a state where we are suffering versus glory. We have God's presence and God's standing absence at war with one another. So, look at the first part. The suffering of this present time and the glory that is going to be revealed to us. And we are smack down in the middle of those two things and we are experiencing both of those at the same time. It's quite tricky because it's a paradox. Because on the one hand, there is suffering at this present time, and the knee-jerk reaction of humanity is always to think that God is in action. On the other hand, we do experience something of God's presence and His glory, His weight, and His character, but not always. And this one we want for, and this one we don't want anymore. And we know that this one will pass, and we will eventually get there, but we are in this in-between time. So look at those words. Suffering versus glory. They are like overlapping circles. And now Paul goes on in verses 19 to 21, and now he explains why this is the case. And that's quite important for us. Because there is, if any of us could just press a button for all of us to finish, we would. But now Paul says, this is where we are at. Let me tell you why we are here. So remember where we came from, the book of Genesis. God creating by his spoken word. When he creates, he says it's beautiful. When he says it's beautiful, he orders it into its place. And when he creates humanity and says, I created all of this for your flourishing, and you need to help me steward this well for the flourishing of everyone. And this is where we came from. But the creation awaits for God's sons to be revealed because creation was subjected to futility. I'll say something about God's sons, and then we'll talk about the futility that it was uh, subjected to. I think the best way to probably explain it is we broke it. Okay? So it was made broken, and we broke it. And it's still broken, but it's being made new. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the interesting line now, isn't it? That creation is eagerly waiting with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. Now, that word revealed in the Greek talks of something showing something to us at the end of something from somewhere else. So it's an unveiling from heaven at the end of something. That's what he's talking about. So here's a good illustration. Think about this stage. And we are watching a play on stage. Who is on stage? Actors. And what are they doing? Well, they are acting out of the play. Will there be an end of this play? There definitely will be an end of this play. And when it all ends, we'll know how the story ends. And then the curtains will close. And then at the end of the play, the curtains will open up again and the actors will be back. But the actors will be transformed. They'll be back to who they really are. Right? So let's say I play the role of Nicodemus. If the play is done and the curtains are closed and they open up the curtains again, I'm not Nicodemus anymore. Then I'm actually Rainer Meyer, an actor who played Nicodemus. And then the people cheer and we all bow down. That's the, the concept of what Paul is talking about here. So Paul says, this thing is broken and it's currently being fixed. And it's being fixed by God through his people. And at the end, creation will know who really was God's people. That's what he says. He says, creation is watching this world thing play off. Creation is longing to be restored. Creation knows that the sons of God and the people of God will play a role in this. So 
So who are they and who are they really? Now Paul says, at the end, there will be this unveiling. And then they will show who the people were who he actually fixed creation through. Phenomenal, now isn't it? And I Paul says, these people fixing this thing that in the end will be revealed to us are God's son. He already gave us that title in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. So we know who we are. Okay, go. So there's an excitement and there's an expectation. Why? Because creation was subjected to futility. Okay? And let's talk about the word futility. This word means two things. On the one hand, something that was really expensive, malfunction, and now it's useless. Okay? And I mean, think about creation, guys. God, Spirit hovered over it, He spoke it into being, and it was made beautiful. It was called paradise. That's the expensive place. And it's now function. And now it's not working the way it was supposed to work. Think about a satellite being launched into space. Supposed to transmit data back to Earth. And now the satellite breaks in space. What a useless exercise. Because the thing from that is it's going to float around in space. So it's expensive. Everyone has high hopes for it. Now it does nothing. That's what the word utility means. So Paul says, on the one hand, the Earth was meant to be awesome, but it was function, and now it seems like it's a useless exercise going nowhere. On the other hand, this word utility also means that it's been given a way for which it was not designed. And that is also a unreal expectation. Has anyone ever tried to cut raw chicken with a spoon? Think about it, guys. You'll be going through the pie, but you'll be pressing and pressing, and the skin will keep on stretching. You'll be so frustrated. Why? Because a spoon is not meant to cut a chicken. Now, Paul says, we started using the earth so that it was not supposed to be used. So, on the one hand, the earth was subjected and it malfunctioned and it's useless. It can't be used for the things that it was supposed to. And on the other hand, it was being used for ways and means that it's not supposed to be used for ways and means. So, the futility of the earth is experienced by the role of the human beings on earth that subjected it to that futility. So think about it. On the one hand, we miss the mark when we think of ourselves as an independent creator, because we were never that. We were always a creature, a creature. On the other hand, the futility of creation is because it's being seen solely in relation to man. We can use it how we want to, and we can abuse it how we want to. So think about the power of human decisions in how we can reform the earth if we want to. We can chop down anything and build anything on it if we want to. And on the other hand, we can make some really good decisions and actually have the earth being renewed and restored again. That's the power of human beings on this earth. And instead of God's creation, ordered by God and God's creatures, keeping it in order, creation is now built order. You guys feel it. But I have to make this point. Then you want, because if you don't understand this point, then you wouldn't understand why Paul says it's growing. So you guys know now why creation is growing. Okay. Now, he who subjected it is quite an interesting sentence. This means that it was God's will that creation would be subjected to uh, humanity. And as humanity fell, that also included in, uh, subjecting creation to humanity's fallen birth. Okay? So God wanted humanity to rule and reign over the earth. And when humanity fell, that means that a fallen humanity will now rule and reign over the earth. And what does a fallen humanity do? We break stuff. Now, is that unfair towards creation? I think that's a really good question. I don't think it is. Let me tell you why. Because God's not done. If God was done with creation, if God was done with the world, if God was done with humanity, that would be really unfair. 
So if they punish humanity and they punish the whales in the deep blue ocean, that God isn't done with either or. God is still busy with both hands. And God is working towards a renewed creation by renewing humanity and then using this renewed humanity to start renewing creation. Isn't that just absolutely phenomenal? Think about it. Restoring human beings, letting them live in a restored environment. And using them to restore back this environment. Okay. Let's look at... Um, let's look at verse 22 quickly, please, at all. So verse 22 says, For we know that the whole creation has been growing together with labor pains until now. This is called personification. It's giving a human characteristic to something that is not human. So obviously the earth is not a human, but the earth acts like a human. So it's typical of uh, poetry in the Jewish language. And I call it says creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Let's be honest, I have never given birth. I have witnessed birth twice. It is absolutely phenomenal to see new life coming into this world. But I can tell you, with the birth of our first child, I spent 12 hours in labor with my wife, seeing our feelings through those contractions and groaning and pains. It is something to behold, and kudos to my wife, and kudos to all ladies who have ever given birth. But the metaphor of birth was actually a natural one to you. Why? Because labor pain is a period of turmoil and anguish, ending in a new order of things. Think about it. It's not really painful now, but we know once that child takes he is or her first breath and we hold them, it feels like a completely new space we are in. So a new order of things awaits, but we still have to go through a period of turmoil and anguish. And now Paul says what's really important is not only that, but we ourselves who have the spirit also grown, and we don't groan although we have, we groan because we have. You guys see what, uh, uh, what Paul is doing at here? But we know what lies after this period that we are in now. And therefore, we are able to shoulder it, and take this, and handle it, and move into it, and accept it because we know what we're in there. It's exactly like a woman going into labor, knowing that the next couple of hours, or maybe even more than that, will be really tough. But I have to go through this for the joy that I will experience at the end. So that's where we are, the first point of the sermon. That is where we are. We've got suffering versus glory. We're experiencing both at the same time. And the reason why we are experiencing all of this is because we're broken. And the reason why we are waiting for the glory to be revealed to us is because God is busy fixing us. But we're still in the middle of these things. And as we are in of this, creation grows and we grow. And we grow because we know where we should be and where we should be living. Are you guys with me? That's the first point. Second point. So where are we headed? Right? What a right Let's look at verses 23 to 25. Firstly, we've got first fruit. And that's important because the first fruit points to where we will be going. So the first fruits are typically the first sheaves of the harvest which means that the harvest has begun. Right, so the fields are ripe, they're ready to be harvested. Hang on, we won't harvest yet, we won't harvest yet, we'll harvest now. And the very first sheaves that come off will tell us that the harvest has started. Because you can't just take first sheaves and leave the rest. If the first batch comes in, the rest of the harvest has to happen. Now we know that the harvest is a whole, of which the first fruits are only a small part, right? So the first seeds that I brought in, is this the whole harvest? No, actually it's not, but it points to something that will come. And for us, the first fruits of the Spirit, being made new from the inside, is a small part of what? Of being resurrected fully, being redeemed fully, being restored fully, and living in a whole new creation. So we are already experiencing something of it. Like, we've got the minutes in our hands. And for me, it's here. It's not all the things that still lie on the field, but it's in our hands already. And that is what we want. So because I have this, I know what is coming. That's exactly what Paul is getting at here. So what are we waiting for? We are waiting for the redemption of our bodies. I just mentioned that. 
But they were also waiting for adoption. Do you guys know how adoption works? A kid needs a house, a parent says, We'll take the kid. Can the parent just teach and take the kid? No. There's a process. And what do you do through that process? You say, I want this child. You go through all the checks and cases, and then someone says something that says, Go and get your kid. Now, when you get so busy, the kid is out. You just haven't picked him up yet, but you're on your way. That's exactly the method that Paul is getting at. So that child and the children of God more important to wants a house, wants a mom and wants a dad. Now the child gets the news, you have a new house. You have a new dad. You have been adopted. The papers are signed. Your school loan has changed. Their certificate has been issued. Pack your bags. They're going to come and get you. And then you go home. That's exactly what you're thinking about yet. That is what you're waiting for. Because you know where we're headed. We've got the first one in the world. We're going to experience the symptom of the redemption and the resurrection that comes through the Spirit. But we're not going to do this. We want to go home. Like, I know I've got a dad, I've just not living in his house yet, but I know, I've met him, I've seen him, they've hugged me, they've kissed me, I'm just waiting for them to come and pick me up. And I don't want to come back to this place. Even though a children's home or a foster care situation might be nice, okay, I'm not saying it's all bad. But the kid will not have come back to this. The kid has got a no from the word go. That is what we are waiting for. That is where we are headed. That is what we place our hope in every single day. What do we need? Be patient. And when we get that from the Spirit, I preached about that last week. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. Be patient. Now, look, I'm not a farmer. But I do know some farmers. And I've been on a farm. Well, it looks to me like the harvest is so ready. I don't know if you guys have ever looked at a field of millet. Like, according to my language, I'm like, these millions are so bad, dude. No one is going to eat them. Why are they taking them off? And the farmer will say, just wait. Just wait. They'll come a time. And when that time comes, then we're going to harvest this whole thing. And it's exactly like that with us having to wait for this reality. Patience is what we need. That's why you need to know that. We could just finish for one, two, three. Four times in one verse and once more in verses 25. Hope is the key for us to be able to live in this reality. If I can just tell you this quote which you have Tim Matthew, I like Tim Matthew. I think he's a phenomenal Bible teacher and I really like the way that he applies uh, the scriptures. Tim Matthew says about hope Christian hope is not based on my circumstances. Christian hope is a vision of hope that keeps my heart and my mind alert and alive to what God is doing in the world, and it has nothing to do with how well my life is going or how well the world is going. This is the kind of hope we so desperately need. And I agree. In this time that we are living in, this is exactly the kind of, uh, the kind of hope we need. Now, guys, we're talking about the resurrection and the redemption of our bodies. We're talking about adoption. We're talking about renewal. I need to state to you that all of this was possible through the story and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If there was no perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, the pouring out of the Spirit, and His return, nothing of this would be on the table. Our adoption into God's family was because of Jesus. Our experiences of resurrection at the moment and redemption at the moment and restoration at the moment is because of Jesus. The fact that we can hold on to the hope that all of this will come to completion in the end is because of Jesus. That is really good news. So you guys imagine, if there was no gospel and if there was no Jesus and if there was nothing to place my faith in, none of this would even be possible for us. But because of Jesus, all of this is possible for us. It's a gift of faith and we need to go through. It's as simple as that. And how do you get the gift? You take the leap. Sounds like a song, really. We could make a song of it. So it's a leap of faith in which you got this uh, marvelous gift of faith that was given to you. Okay, third point. How does the Spirit help us to pray in the in between? I'll just cover this point and we'll be done. Look at verse 26. He says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. 
But number one, where do I just go? Part of the first fruits in verses 23 to 25. Now, this word, hope, it looks a little simple, I think, and a little flat in English. It means to take part with, to assist in supporting, to lend a hand, to come to the aid of. This same word was used in the Greek Old Testament when Moses appointed 17 elders. Twice that he used in that text. You've got a good job to do. You know that. Let me help you. You have assistance. You have someone to support you. You have someone to come alongside you. You don't see what Paul is saying. The Spirit comes alongside us, helps us, takes on the task with us, shares our burden, shares our responsibilities, shares our task, shares this weight of living in this in between. We can transfer some of it to him. He shares it with us. Isn't that just a bigger picture of the Holy Spirit? It's beautiful. So close. That is in us. And while he's in us, he carries our burdens with us. Why? Because we are all creatures and not creators, and we need help from somewhere else. It's just how it is. You need help living in this reality that we are living in. And Paul says, we feel weak when we face this reality. But we've got help. And that help comes from the Spirit. Not only are we tempted externally, but sometimes we also feel this inability to pray. Now, can you guys imagine how discouraging that feeling is? I don't want to pray, and also I'm feeling only tempted. Oh, well, what must I do? Paul has got an answer for us. Paul has got an answer for us. And that's exactly answering the question, how does the Spirit help us to pray in this in-between time? So we feel confused. We feel frustrated. We don't know what to pray. And it's more than just the words to use. It's like we don't know exactly what God's will is. And we feel frustrated and confused. And we feel like we want to pray, but we don't have words to pray. So what should we do now? Well, we should allow the Spirit himself to intercede for us with inexpressible groaning. Think about it. The Spirit doesn't take away our inability to maintain proper dialogue between us and God. The Spirit also doesn't eliminate or transform that inability. The Spirit, the spirit works in and through that inability. You know what I Think about the way we're going to talk. We're in a very discouraging place at the moment because we really want to see it. We really want to maintain proper dialogue with God. We really want to know what God's will is. We really want to pray according to His will. But we don't know. We're struggling. And our prayer says, while you're struggling, the Spirit is there with you, shouldering the burden. And secondly, the Spirit is also interceding for you as the Father, who knows the Father, who knows the Father, so that we can know what God's will is. That's the point that he's making there. Now, there's a couple of interesting words here. Let me just nail them really quickly. So, interceding means to be in between. Right? So, there's two parties, and I'm interceding for the one party at the other party, and maybe even speaking back from this party to that party. That is what an intercessor is. Now, in the Old Testament, the notion of intercession was always felt for. Right? So, there are ways that is very and someone really is interceding for us here, hoping that we will go from there to here. Look at what Paul says. Where is the Spirit? Does the Spirit intercede for us in the heavenlies? Or does the Spirit intercede for us while He's in us? You guys see how close it is? It's really close. We, we, we don't have to wonder if He's busy doing it. We don't have to wonder if He's busy doing it because He is inside of us. And I call these really uh, interesting words inexpressible groanings. No one else in the New Testament does he use that word again, and no one else also uses it. But it is the opposite of having words. So it means to not have words. So who has words on earth? Human beings. Does the human beings have words? And that distinguishes us from animals. So anything that can communicate by using words in creation is human. Is the spirit human or not? The spirit is not. So therefore, the Spirit cannot use words like we know. The Spirit uses inexpressible 
groans. Not a language like man, but still a form of communication. And that communication gets explained as groans. Now, just a real quick sidebar. I, I, I am um, aware of our time. Let me just take a real quick sidebar here. People often say that this refers to praying in tongues. It's still not. Let me tell you why. Because praying in tongues is language that uses words. And it's a language used by human beings, made up of words, Paul calls it the language of heaven. This is not the same. So it cannot be that when we pray in the crowd and the Spirit intercedes for us, then we have to break out in tongues, because that's often what people say. So they don't use 1 Corinthians 5 to 14, they use Romans 8 and say, so if you really want to know if you hit the back of your prayer life, that's when you move over into inexpressible groanings by the Spirit Himself interceding for you. That's not the case that Paul is making. Paul is saying that the Spirit will intercede with you if you don't know what or how to pray, and He will help you to get back to know what God's will is when you pray. Okay, verse 27, last one. Who is the He who searches our hearts? Definitely it's God. Right? It's, a, it's a common description of God in the Old Testament, that he's the one who knows the hearts and minds of individuals, he tries the hearts and minds of individuals. I've got a list this long of references in the Bible, I just won't be reading them now. Why does he search our hearts? Because the heart, according to the Bible, is the seat of the inner life. It's the center, it's hidden from our eyes. It's the place inside of us where we can't see where our ambitions and our values and our motives are rooted. He who searches our hearts and minds knows the Spirit. So luckily, if we can't get out how we feel or what we need, God already knows it. And if we can't get out what we know or what we need or what we feel, the Spirit will turn them into words, fill God, so that they can speak back to us because they also know one another. Do they see us? I encourage you, Paul, to say, you are not lost, you are not done, you are not run out, you are not tired. Keep going. In this, this place of prayer, where you often don't actually know what to say, but you still feel like you should pray. Yes, yeah, Tommy? Okay. Now, God, obviously, is the norm of what is best for His people. That's why we need to uh, uh, pray according to the will of God. And remember, Paul calls us sons again here. He called us sons earlier, and he called us sons earlier in the uh, chapter, so that we can remember who we are and that our um, identity really, really is solidified and displayed. Let me use the illustration just to explain what's going on here in verse 22. Let's say in the real life, so we'll use family as a metaphor, it's holiday time. We're the parents, I'm the dad, and she's the mom, and we've got two daughters. Who's going to plan the holiday? We are. Who's going to make sure that everything is set for the holiday? We are. Who's going to communicate to the kids what the role of the parent is? Both of us will. It's a dynamic process because there's space for both mom and dad in this whole process. And the kids will get a clear communication what the role of the parents are, is. Tomorrow morning, at 5 a.m., we'll wake you up, we'll brush your teeth, we'll get in the car, and we'll roll out the court. Do you guys get me? Yes, Dad, we do. Awesome. Have a phenomenal sleep. Now, the next morning at five, when the will of the parents has to be executed, one of the kids is sick. What now? Now, everybody says, Mom, I really, really, really don't feel well. But you can't tell me what exactly it is that's wrong. But because I really know her, and knows infinitely more than her, she can feel temperature, she can ask if she's got a black nose, she can see if she's got a little post-nasal drip in her throat, she can ask her if she's got a headache, like the dialogue between Marie and Ava. I'm not there. But both Marie and I know what needs to happen now. And then she comes out of the room and she intercedes for Ava. Saying to me, the kid is sick, she woke up a fever through the evening, she feels nauseous. You know, I see how Marie turned the kids' words into something that I can actually understand. And because we really are at the same moment, we know exactly what time we should leave and what the itinerary is and where we should go. I speak back to her and say to her, well, thank you for telling me, I think we should. 
And when I was doing the same, I quickly stood. He was going to complete my sentences and go, give us the cowpool now, give us something to eat, put it in the chair, and then take the cowpool away from the road. And then I'll go, yes, exactly. He was like, put in the cowpool. So I don't know what he's doing, he's doing in my mind. But if they don't really go along with one another, but if they don't speak to the kids, and the kids need to speak more to the world of both of us, but there was something that happened between the sick kid who doesn't know how she feels, and myself, who's got a will for where we should go, but we need to facilitate it. Did you guys see that? And as she facilitated it, she interceded. And as she interceded, she brought comfort to Ava, because what did she say to her? You'll be fine. We're going to give you some parachute tomorrow now. Both of us know that she knows you. We'll um, pull off next to the road, you know, if you don't feel well while we're driving. And we'll leave in a half an hour. So, Ava knows what the will of the parents is, but she was hurt, she was cared for, her mind was, uh, the, the burden was carried of her sickness with her, and our perfect will is still being executed. So, that's the way we're going to come. I think it's a very clear illustration, because that's exactly what Paul is saying here. You have a kid in a bed that doesn't feel well, but you actually don't know what's wrong, and you don't have the word. But you're telling someone, and that someone knows someone else so well that they will figure out what needs to be done, and they'll still get you where you have to be. That's the essence of this passage. Two quick applications. One, there's something about suffering and pain that brings the human experience to a really special point. And Paul is encouraging us through this passage to go to that point, to feel the weakness, and to keep on praying, and then to experience this magic of the Holy Spirit, translating what it is that we want and need in inexpressible groanings, bringing us back to the will of the Father. That's what Paul says. Can I make a confession? I stop praying before I get to this point. I don't know about you. But when I started the passage this week, I thought to myself, why have I not experienced this recently? There is more than enough hardship and ache and suffering in this world. And my conviction was because I stopped. I just stopped. I go, Lord, I've said it a gazillion times. You know exactly how I feel. You know my heart. I don't even know what to pray for the Ukraine Russia conflict anymore. War. It's a war, not a conflict, a war. I don't know what to pray for presidents of both sides. I don't know what to pray for the civilians. I don't know what to pray for the refugees. I don't even know what to pray for NATO, for the European Union, for the UK, for the US, and for us. I don't know. And then I stopped. And I think if Paul was here in the flesh, Paul would go, do don't stop, don't stop. Keep going, keep going. Like press in until you find the place where you are so done and worn out that you don't have words anymore because then you'll experience the Spirit coming to the fore and interceding for you. How about you? Do you have a prayer to this point? Second application. This is one of the most beautiful depictions of the Trinity at work while we are participating in the suffering of this world. So when we are at that place, that from Koch Pain says, think about that moment in our life, the time of suffering and hardship. You'll see God saying, I've got this, because the whole world is in my hands and the whole arc of history is in my hands, and you are my son or my daughter. You are mine. Don't worry. You'll see Jesus identifying with your weakness, knowing what it's like to be a human because he was one, saying to you, I know it's bad. I've been there. You guys, you guys realize that. If anything we would possibly say to Jesus, he'd answer back to us, I know, I've been there before. I have been there for everyone and everything so that this whole thing can be restored and renewed. Keep going. We're almost there. And in these moments, we feel the Spirit saying, I'll stay with you. I'll help you carry it. I'm here. Talk to me. Isn't it just a beautiful picture for the Trinity in that moment? In times of suffering and hardship, the Holy Spirit will help us. Praise be to God for this marvelous, marvelous.